please rise for our first hymn, Earth, Earth, Awake.
prepare the day as printed in your service folders. Let us pray. Eternal and all-merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the act of reconciliation found on page two of your ABC service book.
Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 and 7 through 20. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles, kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here and sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We continue now with our psalm, which is Psalm 30. Uh, if the congregation would join in the bold print. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cry out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ever ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them singing to 
the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you are able for the Lord of Pottery, found on page six of your Leaders of Celebration. <laughs> This is Bishop Ogren's uh, report, um, and uh, it's entitled, Stand Firm and Be Deeply Rooted in God's Love. Dear friends in Christ, grace, peace, and mercy are yours through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This weekend, as we have gathered as the people of God in the Northeastern Minnesota Synod during the 2022 Synod of Assembly, we have been deeply rooted in Bible study, in conversation with one another, in our devotions and worship as an assembly, and in hearing the ways that we engaged in ministry together across Christ's church. It has been enriching and uplifting. 
We have been deeply rooted in connection with God and each other, reminded that God's Word impacts our daily life and that God's Word is richest when shared in community. We are deeply rooted in a boundless God who loves us, all of us, without exception. So why is this story, the raising of Lazarus, told this week? Why does this passage matter? Does it matter? What does it say, not just for today, but to our life in this chaotic and violent world? How does what we do or how we live our daily life speak into, let alone help, in a time of such polarization, fear, and hatred? The good friends of Jesus, Mary and Martha, called for him as their brother Lazarus is dying. Now Lazarus is the only male in the household in a culture in which a woman without a man was profoundly vulnerable to poverty and exploitation. Lazarus was not only a beloved brother, but was also the closest thing to social security that Martha and Mary had. And he was slipping away. So they enlist Jesus to come to their home out of love for his good friends and to do something. But Jesus doesn't come. He doesn't come to be with his beloved friend as Lazarus lies dying. And he doesn't come to honor his friend by being present at his funeral. Imagine the depths of sister's grief and anger especially as Martha comes running out to meet Jesus when he finally does show up. Her heart, wrenched by grief, gives voice to not simply a question, but a lament, an accusation even. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Perhaps she represents all those who will come to church this week, heavy in heart, the grief of their loss still fresh to the point of being overwhelming. If nothing else, her situation proves that being faithful to Jesus is in no way a guarantee against pain and tragedy. There is no one on earth whose righteousness, wisdom, hard work, or good planning will preserve her from seeing the depths that Martha sees. Good people become widows and orphans. It's a fact, and no less of a fact for Jesus' coming. But there is something else. We can cry to God from the depths. There is no depth, no loss, no tragedy, no disease or death, nothing on heaven or on earth <clears throat> or under the earth that can place the world or anyone in it beyond God's redemption. Good people become widows and orphans, but God defends the widow and the orphan and will not leave those God loves bereft. God is redeeming the universe God made and loves. When we cry out from the depths, God hears. When Jesus seems slow in coming to our aid, he is coming, nonetheless. And if we worry that it is too late, Jesus shows that it is never too late. After we have become convinced that all is lost when we are ready to concede to death and are seeking only to contain the damage or bury it, Jesus demonstrates that there is no loss, no death, no tragedy, no death, no power in heaven or on earth or under the earth that can place a person, a situation, or a world beyond God's redemption, beyond the reach of infinite love and abundant life. There are no bounds where God's love and grace is concerned. And we are deeply rooted in this boundless God. Martha's lament only moments earlier, turns into grief transformed and into a courageous confession, not simply about resurrection in general, 
I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day, but a particular confession in Jesus, the one who tarried while her brother died, yet who promised her life here and now. Yes, Lord, she says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Perhaps Martha stands for all those whose faith in Jesus seems incredibly resilient and who serve as both witness and encouragement for the rest of us. Jesus, the one who gives life, who calls us out of not just death, but even our fear of death, the one who weeps for Lazarus and his sisters, is the one for those who stand by and neither understand nor believe in God's promise of life. Jesus, the one who, in raising Lazarus, starts the chain of events that will lead to his own death, the one finally whom death itself cannot contain, promises Martha and promises us, I am the one who raises the dead to life. I am the resurrection and the life. Friends, the promise of resurrection stands at the center of all our worship celebrations when we gather. That's why this story is important for today. That's why it's important to remember that we are deeply rooted in a boundless God that offers life and hope for all people. Imagine those in the crowd who witnessed Lazarus' resurrection and whom Jesus commands later in this story to unbind him and let him go. This part of the story is particularly intriguing. It says to us that even God's work of resurrection is not completely absent of our participation or absent of our being caught up in the act itself. It's not so much that God needs us to do God's work of resurrection, it's that God's work of resurrection isn't limited simply to those whose life is renewed in the moment, but finds its fulfillment as it also catches up, impacts, and even transforms those who witness and are drawn into it. Unbind him and let him go. This is an invitation to be drawn into God's life-giving work to participate in, and in some sense, complete the reach of God's mighty acts. It is a promise that resurrection is not simply a matter of then, whenever that might be, but it is equally a matter of now. And ultimately, this is a call to follow Jesus, the light of God's resurrection. And death no longer needs to terrify us. We can act now. Now there is something to do. Now we find courage to live amid fear. Now we sense God's promise of life helping us to not only live in the shadow of death with confidence, but also to resist the power of death that we concede to, perhaps too quickly. This isn't an invitation to deny death, but God's promise of resurrection does grant us both the permission and power to defy it, to defy God, death's ability to overshadow and distort our lives, to deny death's threat that there is nothing else. Death does not have the last word. We are free to live now, to struggle now, to sacrifice now, to encourage others never to give up now. To live out of love rather than hate now. And to have our actions directed by hope rather than fear now. This is a call to discipleship, really. And here's the thing. Following Jesus can lead us into dark places, uncomfortable, dirty, smelly places. It can lead us into danger and bring us into contact with dangerous people. Following 
Jesus calls us to our pews and our hymns and our rituals, but it also demands that we go out into the world. Deeply rooted in a boundless God, Jesus calls us to love, and love can be difficult sometimes. Following Jesus means that we must love, and it's okay if that scares you a little. It should. But because of God's resurrection promise, the life we share in this world, here and now, no longer should terrify or paralyze us. It means that you have your eyes wide open to the cost of discipleship. I hope that when the church hears Jesus cry, Lazarus, come out, all the people heed his words. Church, come out. Come out of your comfort zone. Come out of your fortresses. Come out of your good old days. Come out of your sin. Come out of holding on to the idols we grasp so tightly. Come out of the lies that tell us how to succeed, consume, spend, buy, then donate and be happy. Come out of your slumber, church, and join in kingdom work, kingdom living. Come out of your slumber and go into the mission God sets before us. Come out of your slumber and live anew. Go and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We are deeply rooted in a boundless God. The massacre of innocence, the politics of fear and division, the rhetoric of hate, these are all heart-wrenching elements of our life in the world, but they do not have the last word and are not the final reality. Prompted by God's promise of resurrection, we can stand against them, hold on to each other amid them, work together towards God's justice and mercy, and offer a testimony deeply rooted in life and love that runs contrary to the testimony of the world. People of God, we are called to be unbound ourselves and to unbind all those immobilized by the fear of death and loss of hope. We are invited this week and always to tell the world that the God who raised Jesus from the dead needs us, wants us, invites us to participate in and even complete God's resurrection work by caring for, standing with, and lending our courage to those who are suffering and grieving, those who are most vulnerable and in need. We have work to do, a call to answer, a resurrection life to lead here and now. We answer this call knowing where our roots are grounded knowing that Christ is with us and that the Holy Spirit will sustain us on the journey. God who raised Jesus from death, the God who promises us life eternal, this God is not finished yet. And we are the instruments of God's resurrection, life, grace, justice, and power here and now.
It says a tongue, but you can't hear me. I'll read loudly. The Apostles' Creed on page 8 in our ABC folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Please join with me and be not afraid. Let us give thanks for the tithes and offerings received 
and commend them to our good and gracious God. Let us pray. Living God, you gather, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the offertory response song on page 8 in your Believer's Celebration booklet.
Tell what God has done.